It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. The New York Times Review of Books says Marilyn Robinson is not like any other writer. She's created a small, rich, and fearless body of work in which religion exists unashamedly, as does doubt unashamedly. Robinson is perhaps best known for her Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, Gilead. This year, she received the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. Her latest book is called The Givenness of Things. It's a nonfiction collection of essays on topics like science and religion, grace and Christology. Robinson is in her final year as professor of English and creative writing at the Iowa Writers Workshop. She joins us over the telephone from Iowa City to talk about reading, writing and faith. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. A full transcript of this interview is available at mi.byu.edu slash mipodcast. Marilyn Robinson, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you. It's been about 35 years since you published your first novel, Housekeeping, and That's a book that made it onto the shortlist for the Pulitzer Prize, and your 2004 novel, Gilead, won that award. And today we're going to be talking about your latest book, which is a book of nonfiction essays called The Givenness of Things. And I thought it was interesting that your total of nonfiction books now surpasses your total of fiction books, five to four. Well, you know, it does reflect in the special intention on my part. I I give lectures a lot. If someone asks me an interesting question, I have a tendency to write a lecture. And then um, over the course of time, they accumulate and I publish them as books. And so um, what my nonfiction for the most part reflects is the fact that I like to talk to people about ideas, you know? Yeah. People have talked about how there's a lot of space between the novels themselves. Some people try to kind of crank out books, and you've been more methodical about it. Is that just, are the books just naturally coming out at that rate, or did you have a set plan? No, I never have a plan. The books uh, just emerge as they do. I don't uh, try to force myself to write a book when I don't have um, a strong sense of what the book will be. Your writing process itself uh, is really interesting. I, I've seen elsewhere you've talked about it. That you talk about when you're writing a book of, of fiction, especially that you're you depend on the emergence of a voice. You say that you don't make the voices; they come to you. And I wanted to hear more about that. Is that something sort of? I mean, it almost sounds like a prophetic, almost, where these voices come to you, and then you find yourself writing these characters. It is a kind of strange experience. Um, and I'm absolutely dependent on it, no question about that. I think that uh, we have not been very good about articulating the the, the workings of the mind, you know. Um, I mean, something happens. That is the integration of things that I've heard and seen into something that um, interprets them as, um, you know, gathered experience. Um I don't know what the process is. I've never seen anything. The psychology would describe that, you know, uh, that deals with this sort of thing. At the same time that I think it's very, very widely characteristic of people that write fiction. It's interesting. I've I've tried my hand a few times at just a couple of pieces of short fiction, and I, what I found was that I would kind of begin with some point or some idea that I wanted to get across, and then I would build characters around that or try to get to it, and and it just seemed kind of forced. And you you teach writing. You're right now at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. How do you work with students as they're beginning to write? And do you find a lot of students approach it the way I described, where they just have this idea and then they write, versus what you describe, which is almost something that comes to you and through you? I find that a lot of people starting out writing try to impose an intention on what they're doing. I try very much to encourage my writers to think of their work as being exploratory. You know, why does this fascinate me? What what? How does it unfold? You know, what are the complexities of it? Uh, rather than trying to um, make some kind of a personal assertion through what they write. So how did that work? Let's take John Ames, for example. He's a character in your novel Gilead that uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, was published in 2004. So I've seen you describe sort of this voice coming to you. You sat down and just started writing as this preacher, and he seems sort of different from you, obviously, one, because he's a man, um, and he's from a different sort of era, so how would you talk to your students about that sort of experience, and then maybe talk a little bit about that character, John Ames? 
Well, you know, I ask my students to be very uh, alert to what is happening on the page and to be responsive to it. One of the things that's very interesting, um, a way in which writing fiction is like painting or probably composing music, you know, within limits, you create the possibility of of um, meaningful variations and so on. Um, it the tendency of fiction ideally is to open, to make things uh, larger than they might otherwise seem. Um, I wrote the character of John Ames in, you know, fully aware that uh, ministers are, do not get to have the good press in American literature. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I was very interested in his voice. I was very enlisted by his voice. Um, I didn't even know if it was a publishable book, frankly, because, uh, you know, someone dying in Iowa in 1956 <laughs> yeah. after a long career as a small-town preacher is not the most obviously fetching subject in the world. But if you uh, are drawn into something, it becomes alive and um that's what I try to make my students feel when something is taking life, you know? Yeah, and there's some, like you mentioned some of these tropes of when you find preachers in, in books, oftentimes there will be the, the the secretly doubting preacher or the uh, the calculating kind of preacher that's a hypocrite or something. And, and like you said, John Ames is sort of a different uh, figure because it's not that he doesn't have doubts or questions um, – but you're writing from inside his head instead of from other people's perspective. Do you think that made a difference in terms of how John compares to other fictional preachers that have been written about? Well, you know, one thing I think that is very important, that is, you know, always important, too important, is that people's thinking can be extremely conventional. And um, it's sort of as if, you know, if you're going to write about a minister, then immediately you know certain things should be true of him, for example, that he's a hypocrite or yeah. whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know. But, I mean, it's, it is, it's like a, the villain twirling his mustache or something. It's just a convention, yeah. you know. And uh, one of the things that I find very true and striking when I do readings and then talk with people afterward at signings and so on, is that there are many people in this country who... Uh, have wonderful relationships with experiences of clergy, um, either because they're in their families or because they have known them through a church or synagogue or whatever. The the um, importance of ministers in American society, I think, is almost inversely proportionate to the negative yeah. image of them that we're always recreating. I don't know why those things happen. I have known a number of ministers in my life. I found them admirable and interesting people. Yeah. I had no basis for treating them otherwise. When you went, so Gilead is the first book in this sort of trilogy, and and it's a trilogy that isn't exactly linear. You you revisit the same timeline in in the follow up book. If these ideas are coming through you. How did you feel about what might be revealed about the characters? I'm thinking of Harper Lee's uh, book that she recently put out that shocked people because there was a scene in there that depicted a character um, in, in a shocking way. Did, did you get a sense that that was possible with your characters as you revisited the same timeline? Or did you have a sense already of of what that backstory or that, simil that same timeline story was like already? Um, well, I, I thought that I knew the characters. Um, when you know characters, whether they're real or fictional, um, they can be very free in your hands, but they are not likely to simply depart from what you essentially know about them, you know? Okay. Um, I, I'm very loyal to my characters. I would not produce them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, historical fiction in particular is really interesting. Um, 
the there's a blog, the Religion and Politics blog, the Danforth Center, published a really interesting piece, uh, a, a big fan of your books, who was also a little bit critical uh, of the second book in, in the trilogy, Home. There's a scene in Home where uh, some characters witness on TV uh, a brutal police crackdown against black protesters in Montgomery, and this is during the civil rights movement. And, and the piece calls your account um, a bit anachronistic. Um, there is a certain amount of anachronism in that. I simply consider it to be creative freedom. I wanted it to be, um, I wanted it to be clear what was happening in the larger culture and um, how it was being re- responded to. And, you know, um, so I moved it. I moved the Montgomery rights a little bit. But I was writing fiction. I wasn't writing history. You were kind of uh, an observer back then, I, I assume. Were you drawing on your own views uh, at, at that time, sort of remembering what it felt like to see those shocking things on television? Yes. Um, I think that that was kind of a national experience, you know, at the time. Um, shocking. Are you surprised? It seems, um, I mean, things don't get, seem to get it at, perhaps as extreme uh, as they were at the time, but... Race has been a big issue in the news uh, over the past several years here with uh, different shootings. And have you been surprised to see that? Well, you know, in a way, it's always a surprise. It's, um, it, you know, I mean, shooting people who are unarmed, shooting children. Um, it, it, it's always, not, it's not something that you simply expect to happen, even though you know it happens over and over again. Yeah. Um, it it has been very discouraging at the same time that at least, you know, attention's been drawn to it and and there have been prosecutions and so on that are certainly called for. Do you think fiction has much to say to uh, the situation that, that people are facing today, especially um, the people in the black community, for example? Uh, do, do you see literature as a, as a way to explore some of the issues that, that people face today? Um, I think, I mean, definitely one of the things, of course, that is a factor is that uh, we're seeing a lot more um, black writers. Yeah. And I think that they're the people, you know, who can really speak authoritatively about how the culture appears from their side, you know. Um, I'm very pleased that at the workshop we have now a considerable number of black writers, and and, uh, I look forward to seeing that uh, become a more and more um, present voice in our literature. What are some of the discussions you have there about um, fiction versus nonfiction? I'm thinking of Coates' book, uh, Between the World and Me. So he's writing from his own personal account, personal voice, versus a a fictional account. Do you guys have discussions there about the differences between uh, fiction and nonfiction and sort of addressing these types of questions and issues? Um, I'm sure there are discussions <laughs> among the students. I have a tendency to teach, you know, classic literature, and I'm, I'm the kind of discussions that I have with them tend not to be that contemporary, even though I'm, I'm, uh, you know, often writing about contemporary politics and life. Um, but you know, people have to do what they have to do. You know, if they, if what they need to say would take the form of fiction, that's great. If it takes the form of nonfiction. That's great. Basically, what we try to do, I think, is to teach them t- that they have that they have to speak out of the integrity of their own minds and experiences, um, and then and then live with that. Do what they have to do. What about the obstacle of didacticism? The, sometimes people can write a book that that's just sort of obviously preachy. Um, and when you, I mean, you, since you've written f- from the mind of a preacher, that seems to be a, an especially pressing risk. This idea that your fiction is just, just a tool to serve some other end. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't write fiction that way. I'm, I'm, I think I'm very careful not to do that. Um, I would not want to feel that impulse in myself. Um, on the other hand, you know, <laughs> every once in a while there's a didactic book like, um, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin mm-hmm. that is necessary and um, 
and very consequential and um, has a right to say what it says in the way that it says it. I'm, I hope I'm not a didactic writer myself. Oh, I certainly don't have those intentions. Uh, but I, I, you know, the world is large and there is plenty of space for all kinds of writing. What kind of things would make your book didactic? Like, what what do you consciously try to avoid? Well, I mean, I'm a teacher who writes essays that are to be read at universities. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> there is a very strong didacticism in my nonfiction, I think. Yeah. The point of it usually... <laughs> The point of it usually being that people ought to go back to original sources and reconsider them, you know. Uh, that, but this is obviously not a fictional subject. That's and that's exactly why I asked the question because it's like as I as I would read, for example, as I was reading through the Givenness of Things, your recent book, and thinking back on reading Gilead, and I would see it's intersections there, but uh, it, it just made me wonder. It's a different mode of writing for you, um, your fiction versus your nonfiction. Yes. One way to think about it, I think, is that I write nonfiction in order to educate myself. I'm the the object of my own didacticism. You know? <laughs> so if I feel that, um, you, well, you, you simply can't write about much of anything without feeling that your information is inadequate, your knowledge is inadequate. And then I do all the research that goes into making me feel confident that I have something that I can say. Um, for me, this is often about American history or theology, religious history. Um, and that does become material for my novels, but it is never the point of the novels. It's simply, uh, you know, the weather inside my head tends to precipitate itself around those kinds of subjects. Have any storms cropped up that surprised you then as you're writing uh, any of the Gilead series or housekeeping even that that you and you're exploring these ideas. Has anything come out that was surprising to you that you didn't anticipate? Well, you know, it's hard to say that in retrospect. I, I try when I'm writing, I'm careful not to outline things, not to uh, to I you know, to think that I can anticipate how a scene will go before I write the scene. As a matter of fact, I have a rule that I don't think about fiction unless I'm actually writing at the time, because uh, the mind goes so so readily toward convention. Um, and the thing that keeps you from becoming conventional is having to put things in, in concrete language. But um, I hope to be surprised by what I write. Then, in re- retrospect, it seems as if it was inevitable <laughs> well, that I would have written what I did. Maybe that speaks to why. I mean, it seems like your books have come out kind of far apart, but they also seem to be written in a burst. And maybe that process kind of explains why. If you're, you know, you you have the rule to not think about it. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, part of the pleasure of writing fiction is, first of all, feeling as if you've actually conjured something that feels like reality, and then then following it out, you know, seeing where it takes you, um, which ideally is always, you know, on, the, on one hand inevitable, on the other hand a surprise to you also. It sounds really fun, and I frankly don't know how you do it. You know, I talk to my students about writer's block, you know, the, the idea that um, they simply come to a point where they can proceed, you know. And which happens to every writer. But what it really means is that you have to stop and consider, you know, that there are things that you have not yet understood. And that can be a very good thing. The the um, ideas that you have after what feels like a drought uh, are very, often very strong, very complex. Um, uh, this This campus, which I walk around on all the time, is sort of dotted with places where I was not thinking about my fiction. And then suddenly I think, oh, of course. And then I don't let myself think any farther until I get home <laughs> and can write. <laughs> That's, it's interesting. I mean, you mentioned the psychology of it and how you, you haven't seen many people look into that. But I also wonder how sleep can be involved in that because our, our minds keep working. And um, 
or so we're told, right? And and it's so writer's block, for example, is something that some people can sleep off and other people can't. When you've confronted writer's block, what kind of things uh, have you done to to work through it? Well, sleep is important. There's no question. I mean, often I fall asleep and then I realize that I'm actually thinking differently when I wake up. Yeah. Differently in a useful way. Um, I think that I, you know, I have written for so many years now that I understand, you know, these moments that feel like block as part of the process. And I simply, I read a book. I, I take, a, you know, I take a walk. I do something that takes weeks of time um, because I know that my mind is working on a problem and I can't hurry it. I can't impose my own preferences on it. Um, I'm, I've am i gotten so that I I have a sort of an appreciation for the autonomy of my mind. Hmm. The fact that if I give it a problem and then forget the problem for two weeks, it will give me an answer in two weeks, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, you, the mind is so much more complex than any description of it. It's hard when you're on a deadline. Sometimes I've been on a deadline, and one tip I got that was really helpful was to write my way out of the block, which is to write about the block. Like, what what are the thoughts I'm having about it, and where did I get stuck, and that sort of thing. And I've I found that to be a, a useful way, at least with nonfiction, um, to kind of work, write my way out of it. Right. Well, you know, I'm almost never blocked as far as nonfiction goes. Um, I seldom have a problem that a nap will not solve. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that that's true. I mean, I, I'm, uh, but fiction, I never write to a deadline. So I have a very, very civilized uh, publisher who never even uses the word, you know. So yeah, um, that's a great help. Well, it's interesting because the voice you cultivate in your nonfiction is still, it seems very literary. And so uh, it, the, the, the sentences seem crafted and, and, and deliberate. Do you, do you find yourself working on the tone of your pieces or is that just kind of your voice? Like, is, are you just sitting down and typing, typing your voice? You don't have to work a lot on shaping the sentences. Well, you know, when I'm writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I'm very aware of trying to make any sentence right before I go on to the next sentence. Mm. I have a, I feel as if a bad thought, a bad piece of articulation is like a structural flaw that means that things that come after it will be flawed also. And so it's just as a matter of maintaining the integrity of the work, I'm very careful not to leave any sentence behind that I consider to be, you know, mm -hmm. effective in any way. Do you find yourself rewriting uh, a lot in either your fiction or nonfiction, or do you do you kind of set it out, like you said, get one sentence right, move to the next? Um, I virtually never rewrite. You've talked about reading and how reading has been a, a way for you to uh, work through writer's block or to kind of get ideas. So I thought it would be cool because you've written some essays on this as well to talk about um, what you like about reading, your experience with reading. You've been drawn to books since you were a little girl. You say you were reading Moby Dick when you were nine years old in Idaho and probably the only nine-year-old carrying around Moby Dick. So talk a little bit about your experience of reading. Uh, well, you know, I had I have a very um, smart older brother, and I I was always trying. He's two and a half years older than I, and and uh, I was always trying to do what he did, you know. <laughs> um, so I was sort of precocious twice over, you know. <laughs> but um, and you know, and frankly, the the Moby Dick thing is classic. I was always reading over my head. I was always reading more than I could understand. Yeah. And um, I think that that was a very good exercise for me. I don't, I mean, I remember this kind of excruciating patience it required, you know. <laughs> yeah. Which was also a good experience. Um, when, I was, when I was in school, I, I, I would fall asleep, <laughs> which the uh, teachers very kindly interpreted as boredom. Yeah. And um, I would be sent to the library often, where there was everything, you know, where there were all these Harvard classics and so on. 
and um, so and and I always read just just beyond what I could grasp, and um, it was a, it was great. I mean, I feel grateful to myself as a child for having <laughs> had these <laughs> had these aspirations. Well, like Moby Dick, for example. I mean, that's a I read that a couple of years ago, and it was a difficult read. And like as a child. With something like Moby Dick, what kind of takeaway would a could a nine year old have with that book compared to years of reading experience? Well, you know, it's sort of hard for me to to reproduce. I remember, uh, you know, there, there there are very very beautiful passages of description of the ocean and so on. Yeah. Or even of of the ship, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I remember those. That was very interesting to me and. I think one of the things that I have gotten from my very long devotion to American literature, Moby Dick being such a classic, is is the uh, amazing descriptive passages that are accomplished in it, you know, yeah. um, which made me feel that the world of fiction was made from the evocation of the ex- the world of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and metaphor and, and, you know, meditation on the appearance of things. Um, and I mean, I'm making it sound like I was some prodigious nine year old, you know, <laughs> but, but it is true that, that there are passages in that book that are so glorious that even, even then they were not lost on me. When you were I landlocked up over there. And over again. Yeah. yeah. Well, but not really because we had a wonderful lake. Oh, Okay. Yeah, second largest body of fresh water west of the Mississippi, we were told. Which which lake is it? Ponderay. Oh, okay. And then Coeur d'Alene Lake, and there are lots of them there. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, I spent a lot of my childhood just looking at water. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I did. <laughs> what about books that you, you haven't wanted to finish? Well, you know, the, for years now... A lot of my reading has been very um, intentional in the sense that I'm, I'm reading often primary source material and so on. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm sort of mining it. I'm exploring it. And I have other than purely literary reasons for, for reading it. Um, I don't read a lot of fiction these hmm. days for the last, for the last number of years. Um, which is no judgment on the on the fiction being written now. I think we're in a very good period. Uh, but it's simply that my curiosity about history is probably as strong an impulse as any I have. Are there books that you re- that you return to, though? Do you have books that you would care to revisit, even though you don't um, read a lot of fiction anymore? Well, you know, I teach seminars that are often on uh, fiction. Um, I've taught Moby Dick many times, as a matter of fact. Um, I teach... Faulkner, you know, um, those are probably the two that I am most inclined to teach. And then I also teach just 19th century American literature. Okay. Um, so, though, I mean, I teach, I'm very fortunate I can teach whatever I want to. And uh, so those are my favorite fictional writers, and I go back to them again and again. How about with um, with the Bible? Do you find yourself returning often to the Bible? You make use of it throughout uh, Gilead, for example. I teach it in seminar. I Last semester I taught um, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and this semester I'm teaching the New Testament. Do you have, um, have you, and a lot of people like Robert Alter's translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, have you made use of that at all, or do you stick with like a different, more conventional translation? Well, since um, the sort of more traditional translations are so essential to American literature, particularly to Western literature. Um, I tend to stay with them. Um, his author's um, impulse is to move the the standard translation closer to um, a Hebrew sense of mm-hmm. what the translation should be. Um, but I'm interested in the Shakespeare's, you know, Shakespeare's Bible, Hemingway's Bible, and mm. so on. Uh, so I teach uh, the Old Testament in the tradition of English language translation. Mm. Um, Shakespeare used the Geneva Bible 
um, so did Milton, so did most of the major writers of that period. Yeah. And we'll get into, a little bit later on, we'll get into um, John Calvin, because you've been particularly drawn to him as a, as a religious mind. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about givenness, um, the latest book that just came out, The Givenness of Things. And as we mentioned, it's a collection of essays that uh, several of them kind of walk the same ground in, in different ways. And you said this was made up of papers that you delivered at different academic conferences and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. well, your first piece in this book, uh, it's called Humanism. I feel like it, it gets right at one of the collection's recurring discussions, which is the relationship of science and religion and, and humanity in general. And you have some pointed things to say about the current study of neuroscience. Why did you become interested in neuroscience in particular? Well, you know, um, a lot of my essays are responsive to the things that I encounter when I'm out in the world talking with people, you know. Um, if you go to conferences uh, about, you know, psychology, uh, neuroscience tends to be a a very large subject there. And uh, as, as a result of that, of course, I've read a good deal of material that comes from that discipline. Um, I focus on it because um, I think that a lot of thought in the larger world is focused on it now. You criticize some scientists. There, There's sort of scientism, um, sort of a dogmatic adherence to certain um, ideas of science that you spend some time criticizing, but you also have wonderful things to say about science. For example, there's a quote here where you say, um, the new cosmologies... Uh, that scientists have have sort of put together opens so many ways of reconceiving the universe that all sorts of speculations are respectable now, and and you see that as a good thing, uh, whereas some Christians are shy away from that because it seems to threaten, say, the Eden narrative or something. Right. I I uh, I do have a tremendous admiration for you know for solid scrupulous science. I. Um, I feel as though I'm reading the Psalms when I read, you know, these new accounts of the universe and so on. I think that I'm disturbed, frankly, by how readily people who consider themselves Christians turn toward fear. Um, It seems to me as if there ought to be a very primary faith or trust in God as a sustaining presence. that will allow you actually to look out and see what is unfolding and see what, you know, I mean, God is the God of history. You can't hide from history. It's, it's, uh, it seems to me to be, um, irreligious to refuse to, uh, understand your humanity in terms of, of the way of the world, the way the world, it broadens and complicates and all the rest of it. I'm, I when people say they're afraid of something, I think, uh, you know, I think that there's a problem with their religion, frankly. I'd like to hear more about that. Like, what kind of things do you would you rather uh, inform their uh, people's approach to questions like this? Because it it makes sense if you've sort of, especially for more literalist readers of the Bible, they've read that Adam and Eve were created in this garden, and they particular this fruit and it's a pretty simple story there they fall then death is enters into the, death enters into the world the earth is said to be you know 6000 years old based on bishop usher's timeline so when they hear these stories of the of the cosmos being like 14 billion years old and and a big bang and stuff it it seems like a radically different story it is <laughs> there's no question that it is um nevertheless uh you know there is, you know, there's, among the strongest thrusts of biblical narrative, if you take the Bible whole, is that the world is full of the glory of God, um, that it is there to be seen, it is there to be a source of celebration and wonder. Um, I think it might be wonder, actually, that they're afraid of. Hmm. Um, I don't, you know... I mean, there's the first creation narrative as well as the second creation narrative. Right. And the first one is uh, metaphysical and, and vast and 
you know, full of the energy of being. Um, the second, I would say, is is a kind of parable to explain the meaning of, you know, the creation of, of uh, Adam and Eve, of male and female. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is just so ironic. Science has done so much to sort of confirm the insight that's reflected in the in the first creation narrative that it seems amazing to me to reject it as in effect they do by insisting on the second creation narrative. I think that's where it gets difficult, especially I think for more fundamentalist um, minded readers who just collapse those narratives together, which really boils down to privileging, I think, the second narrative over the first one. Without question. So the your book, it's it's about the givenness of things. This fits right into this discussion about neuroscience. Neuroscience seeks to explain human consciousness and, and emotion and experience strictly in terms of physical, uh, empirical things. And the brain is basically the most complex computer uh, known, but it's essentially a machine. So... For example, if we get frightened, a neuroscientist might say, well, it's not you who are afraid. Uh, It's this little patch of gray matter responding to environmental stimuli. That's a a quote from you describing that position. Talk a bit more about that and that kind of uh, description of what it is to be a conscious human, just this mechanistic view. Well, I mean, I think that the metaphor that would call the brain um, either a computer or a machine um, is not acceptable. The, uh, we create machines that uh, that simulate certain kinds of human behavior. We create computers that simulate consciousness as closely as it can be done, which is not very close. Um, but the the essential model is the, is the brain itself, which is the most complex thing known to exist in the universe. Um, it's you know it it's without comparison, certainly with not to be compared to anything that we've contrived uh, to simulate it. Um, I think that there's a, an impulse in bad science to attempt to create models of simplicity that make things seem comprehensible, which are not. Yeah. Um, as, as I said in that essay, you know, Fear is a, is culturally created as much as anything else. You know, if you're if you are an Easter Islander in the 17th century, you're probably not afraid of bankruptcy. You know, yeah. Uh, there are that it's that whole vast part of the brain that doesn't light up that figures out whether you, you know, that that determines whether or not something is fearful. You know, you go to a hotel and you find there is no 13th floor. You know, how culturally is <laughs> that, you know? Uh, and the fact that somebody seeing a 13th floor might have a little flare of panic. Uh, the panic is not accounted for by the number 13. Culture accounts for that. And culture is way, way more deeply implanted in the brain than in some little signal that flares, you know, a fight or flight. Right, and this is people that will that pick up this book will kind of get obviously see a, more of your argument there. But the idea that you spoke about earlier, uh, the opposite of the fear, is this sense of wonder. And let's talk about that for for a minute. In your chapter called "Proofs," uh, I see that as a, a rigorous defense of mystery, almost a rational defense of <laughs> of mystery, ironically enough. And there's a lot of religious believers today who want certainty in their faith. And some people just outright claim it. And then, then you've got critics of religion, new atheists like Richard Dawkins and people like that who've kind of adopt the same idea. They, they, they put their feet down in certainty and they criticize religion for being a poor way of dispelling mystery. And then they say, see, this is why religion is terrible and because it can't handle mystery, and we can. Uh, we've got the solution. So, but there are some people who would say, I think some more scientific-minded people who would read this essay on proofs uh, and say, this is kind of a cop-out. You're just trying to shut down answers, or you don't like these answers, and so you're saying, oh, it's just a mystery. How do you respond to that kind of a reaction? Um, I think I perhaps I'm using the word if I use it in a different sense than some people do. I don't think that or most people, perhaps. Um, I 
you know, you, you mentioned Calvin before. I think that we are led forward in experience by the new question that arises when any question seems to have been addressed, or the new thousand questions. Um, I don't think that this is exhaustible. You can't read can't read anything about contemporary cosmology and think we will ever have an exhaustive explanation of reality. It's it's very primitive to imagine that we could have, you know? Yeah. I mean, read about dark matter, for heaven's sake, which does not even apparently have an atomic structure. I mean, it's like completely other, and it's 80 or 90 percent of reality, you know? We will... Uh, it's it's phenomenal what human beings have managed to understand, to grasp, and it's phenomenal, much more phenomenal, how many things we have to, in all modesty, assume will exceed our grasp. And this is, I'm not making a theological argument here, I'm talking about the physical universe. Right, and I think there are a lot of scientists who are on board with that kind of approach. I think you get some fundamentalist-minded scientists who um, who don't see it that way. But as far as the theological mystery, you, you also bring up a few of those throughout the book. One of them, speaking of Calvin, is predestination. And I think one of the most outstanding pieces in this book is metaphysics. And you say that when people try to figure out predestination, you say this is a classic instance of an inquiry beyond human capacity – uh, and you, and then you have this. This is a really remarkable line. You say Christ is a response to certain of these questions, a response, not an answer. What did you have in mind there? Well, uh, you know, it's not as if there were a question to which there is an answer in any in any normal reductionist sense of those words. You know, it's uh, that. You know, human life, the pa- human passage through the world, birth to death, is is sacred, um, and that's what we can. That's the essential thing to know about it. That's what the the question for us is: How do we respond to the fact of the sacredness? Um, and and that's a continue a question that's continuously renewed in every encounter with human beings. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that the difference between my theology and many others is that I do see it as, as dynamic in the sense that the questions that are given to us are new in every case, specific to our individuality in every case, um, and not to be solved with one, you know, one underscoring of, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't even, I, I'm not articulate in in a theological understanding that would imagine any sufficient and final answer. Well, it's it's something hard to respond to because it like the very point is talking about the difficulty of, of uh, describing it to begin with, right? But that's one of the things that I think contemporary science does so well. It gives us some sense of what is beyond the reach of our articulation. And I'm speaking here of physical reality, but I consider that an analogy for reality altogether. Do you think there's a religious impulse to the scientific endeavor then? Oh, I mean, you know, Isaac Newton, a great many scientists, and I would say also uh, Descartes and many of the other great minds and scientists, John Locke, they're very religious very, very religious. They write what amounts to theology. The idea that there's any sort of necessary opposition between them is is an artifact of late, strange developments in science and religion, too. Is that maybe one of the reasons you've been drawn so much to scientific questions? People might be surprised in reading the givenness of things, how frequently you're talking about scientific issues, if they've only read your fiction, where scientific questions don't really get raised there. No, that's true. Well, it would be, speaking of anachronism, most of the science that I talk about would be very anachronistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but um, you know, I I find contemporary science to be extremely beautiful. I read it before I began 
writing anything that reflects on it, you know, necessarily, of course. But my reasons for reading it are, you know, a a very profound um, admiration for a great deal of the thinking that goes on and a great deal of the imagining and envisioning and hypothesizing that goes on. It's a beautiful use of the mind. Let's turn now to John Calvin. Um, We've spoken about him a little bit already. He's a a reformer and theologian, and he's a touchstone for your thought. And you joke about how people seem surprised when they hear that, because there's this stereotype of Calvin and of Calvinists sort of being these puritanical, humorless people. Or There's also a version of Calvinism today that um, that affirms a few fundamental ideas. TULIP is the acronym. They have things like total depravity, um, the idea that humans are just sort of garbage and and, or the idea of limited atonement um that god has selected certain bought a certain elect people to save and other people elected them to damnation without their input and i think that's probably the calvin that people have in mind when they express surprise at your affinity for john calvin and even i was trying to figure out what calvin is for you well you know for me calvin is what calvin wrote um he is a, a very classic example of a 16th century French humanist. He um, insists on the unavoidable realization of the divinity in human beings as such. You know, um, he uh, that business about tulip. You know, I mean, what did what did a 16th century Frenchman know about tulips? You yeah, know, yeah. that silly acronym was coined in, in the United States, as I understand it. Um, he's a very non-dogmatic thinker. He does struggle with predestination, which all the major theologians have done, you yeah. know. The, um, and uh, I think, as I said, I think in that essay, that uh, we we don't, I know from reading my physics, but we have no idea what time is. Um, and that the sort of uh, incremental model of it that we have can't be right. Um, I think that everybody from Augustine to Calvin to, you know, Ignatius of Loyola was trying to make life understandable in terms of a model of time that is commonsensical but can't be true. And um, so I I don't worry about that. I'm, you know... um, I, I don't know why people fastened on that in regard to Calvin when it is true of so many writers, Luther, for example. Um, I am very drawn by his, first of all, by his enormous admiration of the human being as such. Uh, you you don't have to read far into the Institutes to to find this very explicitly stated. And then beyond that, he has a sort of... A, um, Visionary psychology, in a sense, he he treats all reality as visionary. Um, the con- the world continuously newly presented to any human consciousness as an address to that person on the part of God, so that um, he sees. Uh, I mean, everything is always a new question, basically. When, when you're in, you encounter someone else, no matter what the nature of the encounter, the, it's a question God is asking you, and your quest, the question is, what does God want from this encounter? You know, which is always assuming that whoever you encounter is as valuable to God as you are. So um, that that's a, a kind of um, dynamic ethic in a way, you know, um, the idea of of the world that presented to you as being a visionary experience that's full of meaning, that's intentional. Um, this is very beautiful to me, and I don't find it in other theologies. It seems so far from some contemporary Calvinists and that total depravity idea. And you and your book outline... Uh, what you call a high anthropology, a high human anthropology, alongside your high Christology. Those are sort of the technical terms you use. But it seems to be a rejection of uh, of the idea of the total depravity, which is, again, the sense that humans are just sort of almost repugnant um, 
creations and it's it's I think about original sin and that type of thing. Where is that in Calvin's thought? Does he talk about depravity? Of course, he uses the word depravé, you know, um, but that means that means warped, like you would say, a mirror, a flawed mirror that nev- that gives you an image but never an accurate image would be depravé, or a text that has errors in it, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, scribal errors or something. It's depravé. So, or corrupted, corrompu, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, he's talking in in the framework of religious assumptions that's basically Thomistic. And Thomas said that baptism made people capable of reason. It made them, it undid the effect of... uh, of original sin in so far as their consciousness is concerned. Mm-hmm. And and for Calvin, uh, our consciousness is on the one hand very efficacious and on the other hand highly unreliable. And uh, so he said, no, we are totally depravé, uh, which means that we are not more capable of reason than, for example, the unbaptized, you know, uh, that the, the drama of human understanding is always the mediation of experience through a mind that bears the marks of the fall. A limited mind, in essence. Exactly, and, and uh, many historians, like Christopher Hill, who's a very good 17th century historian, um, they, they associate the rise of science very strongly with Calvinism because it assumes that on the one hand, you can make a good interpretation of reality, and on the other hand, you always have to assume that there are errors in your interpretation of reality, so that a sort of uh, scientific method arises out of it. It seems there was a turn then for some. It's kind of like when you compare some of the fundamentalist um evangelicals and the turn that they took in the 20th century back to a more literalist Bible interpretation, this sort of thing, that a similar movement then must have happened within uh, American Calvinism, where there um, there was also sort of a fundamentalist shift within the overall movement. Do you see, is that is that accurate then? There's sort of divisions within Calvinism that way? Um, yes. Well, you know, Calvinism is actually a huge tradition in this country, which you don't realize until you've gone somewhere else. But the um, the great mass of Calvinism is would never call itself by that name. American liberal Protestantism mm-hmm. is descended from Calvinism, uh, from you know New England settlement Calvinism, and it you know it has nothing to do with tulips. It has nothing to do with uh, this insistence on on depravity or. If, to the extent that you would use the word, they'd have looked it up first, you know. that There are radical uh, traditions of Calvinism that come from, for example, the Low Countries, um, but the, the, the most influential strain in American Protestantism is Calvinism without using the word, okay. and that by which I mean liberal, Calvin, li- liberal Protestantism. That's Marilyn Robinson. She's the author of the novels Gilead and Home and other novels. She's also the author of a new collection of essays, The Givenness of Things. We'll take a brief break and be right back for the conclusion of the interview. One of the hardest parts of preparing a great lesson for Sunday school or seminary class or family home evening is coming up with good questions to ask about the scriptures. We've all heard teachers ask questions that seem to fall flat. Most of us have been teachers who've asked stale questions, and the class sits there in silence because everyone knows the answer but nobody wants to say it. The real key to an engaging lesson is having good questions. That's what makes the Maxwell Institute's Scriptures Made Harder book series so valuable. These aren't books that you sit down and read straight through. They're tools. They're they're workbooks that you can use right alongside your scriptures. Instead of telling readers exactly what to think, they're filled with questions that prompt deeper reflection. So we have the New Testament made harder, and we also have the Old Testament, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Book of Mormon made harder as well. Each book is available in print and digital formats. For more information, go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash madeharder. We're speaking today with Marilyn Robinson. She's the author of The Givenness of Things, 
I asked you earlier about the intersections between your fiction and nonfiction, and your essay on experience pointed me right back to one of my favorite passages from Gilead. And in the essay, you're talking about Calvin's view of a person as being depraved, like we talked about, but also as possessing a better self. And in the essay, you write, Calvin sanctifies the best pleasures of existence, from the work of our hands to our dazzling senses, to the heroic aspirations of our sciences. For him, the spiritual is intrinsic to the temporal, a present pleasure most felt when we do anything that amazes us as an exercise of the God-given brilliance that we take for granted. This is soul as experience. And there's this passage in where Reverend Ames is writing to his young son. There's a shimmer on a child's hair in the sunlight. There are rainbow colors in it, tiny, soft beams of just the same colors you can see in the dew sometimes. They're in the petals of flowers, and they're on a child's skin. Your hair is straight and dark, and your skin is very fair. I suppose you're not prettier than most children. You're just a nice-looking boy, a bit slight, well-scrubbed and well-mannered. All that is fine. But it's your existence I love you for, mainly. Existence seems to me now the most remarkable thing that could ever be imagined. I'm about to put on imperishability. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of an eye. That is the most wonderful expression. I've thought from time to time it was the best thing in life. That little incandescence you see in people when the charm of a thing strikes them, or the humor of it. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. That's a fact. While you read this, I am imperishable, somehow more alive than I have ever been in the strength of my youth with dear ones beside me. You read the dreams of an anxious, fuddled old man, and I live in a light better than any dream of mine, not waiting for you, though, because I want your dear perishable self to live long and to love this poor perishable world, which I somehow cannot imagine not missing bitterly. Existence itself seems like the most remarkable thing that could be imagined. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that from you, because it's such a beautiful passage. Well, you know, when I was talking before about the sort of the idea that experience is visionary intrinsically, you know, yeah, um, that it, it's a question um, not, you know, of having isolated religious visions, but of being sensitive to the fact that uh, that character of experience is always available, uh, waiting to be perceived, in effect, you know. Um, and so... You know, one of the things I think that's striking about Calvin is that he doesn't talk about heaven very much at all. He says we can't know anything about it. We're given this world. Um, this world is essentially visionary, and, and it is um, a waste of what we are given to try to uh, dwell on what we have not been given in the same sense. We have not been shown or told, you know. Um so I, I'm very aware of John Ames as seeing the, the sacred as implicit in the ordinary, and I think that's true and important, frankly. I wanted to ask before we go uh, what you have coming up next, what you're working on, and if you foresee any possibility that you'll be returning to the world of Gilead in the future. Well, you know, um, I'm working on some lectures now that I'm giving um, – over the next couple of years, you know. Um, I hope that I'll be able to work on fiction in that same time. I've usually worked on both together. Um, but we'll see. I don't anticipate, you know. Who knows? Maybe yeah, somebody will start talking to you again. That could very well happen. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today, Marilyn. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure.